We've got our dice tower to start here. I've got eight questions. You get three rolls and we're going to see what you get. Number one is scary stuff. Okay. What subgenre of horror scares you most? Is it a slasher movie, supernatural, you name it? Body horror. Body horror. The fly. You know, and the fly where it's like, oh, and the gooey things. And then I just watched Malignant. And when her... I was just on the ceiling. I was on um, mm, hard pass, unfollow. Roll number two now. Five is roll swap. If you could swap roles with anyone in the cast of Midnight Mass, who would you choose and why? Matt Bidell playing Sturge. Matt Bidell is the unsung hero of Midnight Mass. He is doing some incredible character work. We used to call him Grandpa Trash Man on set because he's got <laughs> this beard. And in every scene, he's like taking out the trash or he's like, he's got a cup of coffee talking about fuel. And that's the kind of stuff that just lights my fire. All right, you got one more roll on the tower here. Number eight is Crockett Island because it kind of feels like all of the residents are a little defined by their jobs. If you had to live on an island like that, what would you want your job to be? Oh, I am like the witch who has a scary house and I maybe sell like like handmade potions and things at the farmer's market and the kids are a little freaked out by going near my house after sundown. I don't think I could imagine a better answer to that question. <laughs> I don't think like neighborhood witch is a job, but I'd make a job out of it. It should be a job. If if you make that a job, I will follow in your footsteps. You will be my role model. We will unionize. I like that plan. Hello, everyone. Welcome back for a brand new episode of Collider Ladies Night. I'm especially excited for this one because I have a favorite on the show right now that I've yet to get the opportunity to talk to. Kate Siegel, Midnight Mass, and so many other things that I'm a massive fan of. Hello, what an intro, thank you. So I was doing my homework. I read that you went to Syracuse. Did you study acting there? Did, I got my BFA in Syracuse. They have um, a cut program at Syracuse where after sophomore year, you have to re-audition for the program. I failed that three times. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, so what, what happens? Do so you commit to that track and then you fail that? Do they push you into another major? Into another <laughs> it's audition? so, this is so bougie, like liberal arts school, because if you don't pass your audition, you don't get your BFA, which is the Bachelor of Fine Arts. You just get your BA, which is the Bachelor of Arts. And like for all of these like upper middle class actor types, the BA is like the worst thing they can imagine. I can't imagine a world. And of course, this is not the real world. This is not what is important, but it feels important in the moment. And so I would drag myself into my advisor's office and be like, I have to audition again. I have you have to let me try again and I'll study harder and I'll work harder and I won't give up. And that is like the the precursor, that level of stubbornness, I think, has followed me through my whole career to get me all the way to Crockett Island. I love talking about going to school to study a craft like this because it's necessary for some, it's not for others. So going through that experience in the end, what is something that you learned in school that you think is invaluable in the work you do today? And then what is something that happened when you hit your first set that no schooling in the world could have prepared you for? It's funny because... um. I think the thing that was invaluable was the four years I got to make mistakes and to be a messy actor and to be a bad actor and to get drunk with my friends and then not have real life repercussions for that. I got to make my mistakes in private before Facebook exists. And unfortunately, when I stepped on set, I realized the acting training was completely off because I was being trained for Shakespeare and theater and projecting to the back of the room and um, a lot of intellectualizing of the experience, which for me gets me in my head and completely out of the reality of talking and listening. So I had to take everything that Syracuse taught me and sort of reframe it and get it out of this, I need to get an A, I need to pass my class, I need to pass this audition and get it into a much more messy artistic place. And so it gave me all the mistakes I needed to be an artist, but it also gave me boundaries that really messed with my head. So you graduate from that program in 2004, I believe, and I'm looking on IMDb. It says your first screen credit is 2007. What happens during that gap? Is it kind of just doing the audition grind? So do you have like a sad music sting for when things get sad? Because <laughs> like I, mean, I could put one in. 
Wah, wah. So just like prepare yourselves, y'all. So my dad died really suddenly at the beginning of my senior year of Syracuse. He like healthy guy playing tennis had a massive heart attack was had passed before he hit the ground. Understandably, this shook up my whole life. And I said, you know what? I don't want to be an actress. It's just like, I don't want to be in that place of emotions. I don't want to be in this place of rejection. And so I went back to DC. I grew up outside DC and I decided I was going to work in international finance. Obviously. (laughs) And so I spent a summer interning at the World Bank. And um, I was like, this is going to be me and it's going to be very cerebral and it's going to be all of the stuff that I think would keep me from feeling the depth of the loss. Like I was like, I'll just live on the outsides of emotion. And so, and then I was scrolling when I was supposed to be preparing information about the Sudan, I was just scrolling backstage postings and there was an audition at the Folger Theater in DC for Much Ado About Nothing. And I was like, I don't know, whatever. And at that time you had to like print out your headshot and like staple your resume to the back. It's like old school submissions. And I mailed it in and they called me in for an audition. And in true Kate Siegel form, I didn't book that one, but <laughs> um, that the Folger po- called me in for the next show when I got sucked back into acting. It's like, I tried to leave. Every time I tried to leave, they pulled me back in. Turning to Mike now, at what point in your collaboration did you realize that he was an actor's director that really suited how you like to work, where he brought something out of you that maybe other directors out there couldn't. I met Mike for the first time in an audition setting and it was nine pages of sides. And this was when I was deep in the grind where it was like I was going out three to four times a week and things were getting close, but nothing was catching on fire. And I was in a real athletic mindset where I was like, what do I do to achieve what people want? And how do I practice? And what very linear in my thinking about being what somebody else wanted me to be. And I loved this script. Obviously, Mike was a genius way before I showed up and like way before I knew who he was. And I really wanted this part. And I worked really hard to do it right and be a good girl and get an A plus on this audition. And I went in and I did the nine pages and he gave me a direction and I did the nine pages again. And generally speaking, with an audition that size, you get about two or three takes. They don't have an hour to work with you. And we'd finished and I felt the room, like there was like the tinders were smoking, but I hadn't caught anything on fire. And I was really beating myself up in my head. And I I didn't want to get out of the chair. I didn't want to leave because I loved the script so much. And Mike looked at me and he kind of sat there for a second. And he was like, can you just do one more? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was waiting for the notes he was going to give me. And I was like preemptively nodding because I was like, I'm a good girl and I will take this note and I will do a good job. And he looked at me and he waited until I stopped nodding. And he said, can you just do one just for you? And I was taken aback because I didn't know what that meant. I had forgotten. And, um, and, And something in me was brave enough to take the amount of time, which felt like an eternity was probably two minutes and figure out what it was that I wanted. And my acting changed forever on that day. I love that story so much. That was Oculus, right? No, that was a movie that was not made. Oculus. Yeah. I got a call again in, in the Kate Siegel story. I didn't book that one, but, (laughs) um, in, the realm of the world, like a couple months later, he called and he said, the person who's playing this part in Oculus, she broke her leg and she can't do this anymore. And it's a small part, but I really want to work with you. And I promise if you do this for me, there will be dividends in the future. That was, was not lying, <laughs> not lying. There were dividends. So the next one here that I have to ask you about is obviously Hush, which is a fantastic film. If anyone out there has not seen it, please go look it up and watch it right now. I do have to stop here because there is something you've missed. Ooh, what? It's called The Curse of the Black Dahlia. So I didn't entirely miss it. Like I, I looked it up and I looked into it. <laughs> you can't give up on The Curse of the Black Dahlia. Like this is a reality of every actress. She is gonna start somewhere. Do not let them think that I started at Oculus and then hush. Please do not disillusion these women. I started in the non-union $100 a day Curse of the Black Dahlia where a character dies by running up and down the steps too much. I hope everybody finds it and realizes that like we all start somewhere. 
I hadn't been able to find where to watch it, but I feel like now that you just explained to me what happened to your character, I am determined to see. Oh, no, 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 no. My character dies in a much funnier way. There is uh, just this one character. I mean, I, I, my sister will occasionally send me video clips of her reenacting some of that movie where I, a 24 year old Kate Siegel is um, promoted to boss of a whole company. And I'm very serious, I'm a business lady, Seagull. It is, I mean, I hope sales go through the roof of this hilarious and wonderful movie. Hill House is next. So yet another one that I want to ask you a million questions about, but I'm going to ask you about my, my favorite jump scare in the entire show, which is also one of my favorite jump scares of all time, because I'm not an easy one to catch with moments like that. It's the scene in uh, episode eight. I, I don't know, just tell me everything about filming mm-hmm. that and making that kind of jump scare work really well on set, even when it's not all coming together in the same way that it would for an audience member. Yeah, well, what's fun about that jump scare is that one of the reasons it works is because there hadn't been any other jump scares like that up until that moment. It was really there were stings and like a quick shot of Carla's character or like the creepiness of the bent neck lady and then she drops in, but there hadn't been a pure jump scare until episode eight. So everybody was lulled into a real false sense of security. Like there was like, it's gonna be scary, but it's not gonna happen. And then we were running the scene, the car was on stages. So we weren't in on a street. We were on in like, uh, they have all these um, LED screens around you projecting uh, the road you're going by and you're, and Elizabeth Reeser was pretending to drive. And we were, had always been playing, been told to play the scene straight. You're not in a horror show. You're in a family drama, play the scene. And we were, and unbeknownst to us, Mike had told Victoria, jump in whenever you want. And so she did. And that rea- we were, she got us so bad because she wasn't supposed to come in for another two pages. We had a whole thing happening. And when she came in, I think it would just, it got us so completely off guard. It was brilliant. And that noise she made, that noise, she was always great at those, the scary noises. Let's get into Midnight Mass now. So I know Mike had been working on this idea for a while. When it was in its earliest stages, did he share much of what it looked like back then with you? And how does that compare to what we get in the final product? So the first incarnation of midnight mass was in 2010 and it was a novel and so it and he has about three chapters of it and i had read it and it was great and then it was a movie and it was great and then it was a series that was taken around town and everybody passed on it but certain things happened in that time like for example he got married he had kids he got sober so he had written about sobriety before he was sober and and so it it, it was a slow growing plant. It wasn't like Hush that sprung up like bamboo where you can basically watch it impale somebody if you wanted to. This was like a really slow bloom. And it, it almost feels like one of those corpse flowers that blooms once a year. And it was just a matter of perfect timing that we got it exactly on the bloom. So another thing I was reading about is that the Aaron Riley relationship changed a lot over the years. What is the biggest difference between where it started and where it winds up? Well, I think where it started is kind of a more youthful idea of what love and loss is. Because before you've lived into your late 30s, early 40s, you have a sense of like what it would be like to see your high school sweetheart again. How would you feel? Could you get back together with them? Maybe they were the love of your life. And, but as you get older and you experience more, you realize that you really can't go back home again. And to fall in love with your high school sweetheart would be a whole new experience. You would be technically falling in love with a whole new person. Maybe you just recognize certain elements. And I think his understanding of that deepened. And so it let Riley and Aaron feel more like, like the ghost of passion as opposed to like, it was fireworks when they saw each other again and they're like deeply in love and they're immediately together because that's just not the way it goes with when you think of what the two of those people have been through. I'm gonna tell you, you are incredible in this show. You are incredible in everything that I've ever seen you in. I'm gonna circle back and watch the the Black Dahlia and we'll talk about that one day. (laughs) Huge congratulations to you, Kate. And I can't wait to chat again for another project soon. (laughs) 
Yeah, thank you. It's great talking to you. 